So I know it's it's one fifteen, and I usually give a minute or two for more people to to filter in, and and I'll I'll keep letting people in. But we only have thirty minutes, and this is such a good topic. I don't want to to rob us of any time. So um, I want to go ahead and and kick us off today and say welcome and thank you for coming to our session today on reading in STEM. Um, I want to introduce you to some uh, valued valued colleagues that are here to help lead this session today. Um, we're excited to um, share just some thoughts and some ideas and to have a conversation about reading in STEM today. So first up, um, let you guys introduce yourselves. Um, Brennan, you wanna go first? You're first on the list. Sure, uh, Brennan Ransdell. I'm the mathematics division chair here at Mizzou Academy. I've been here since uh, 2009. Um, if you have any students who might be interested, I always got to put a plug in for we have math club that meets on Fridays and we're willing to adjust the time. Hi, everybody. I'm Erica, a division chair of science at Mizzou Academy. Um, I also uh, help sponsor with uh, Dr. Sherry Denny, the Mizzou Academy science teams. We have a science club for any students who are interested in getting on Zoom and talking about science with their peers all around the world. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you, Angie. Absolutely. And then Becca. Hi, everyone. My name is Becca Hannock. Um, I work with Mizzou Academy through my doctoral assistantship. I'm working on my doctorate in mathematics education right now here at Mizzou. So we brought um, everybody together with the idea of, of talking about what does it mean to read in STEM? Because a lot of times we think about literacy and we, we think about reading and writing, speaking and listening. And that's that's English, right? That's just English, right? That's the only place we do literacy. That's the only place we have to worry about reading. And that is, I, I think, and in my opinion, definitely not true. And one of the things we're going to kind of talk about today are some of those, those thoughts, because the ability to read in STEM and understand STEM being science, technology, engineering, and math, to be able to understand that I think is just as important of getting the foundation um, of what it means to build these skills and become literate in reading, in math and in science and in technology and engineering. And so kind of what we're going to uh, take a look at today. And so we're gonna do this kind of like a panel and I'm gonna raise some questions and we're just gonna throw it out to our um, experts to kind of give their thoughts about each one. So first up, is reading in STEM the same as reading in other disciplines? How is it the same and how is it different? So let's shoot it off to Brennan. So, it, you know, some of it is uh, just common sense more, more than anything as far as how they're the same, how they're different. Uh, for me, one of the main points of mathematics, uh, you know, when it comes down to it, uh, is changing the way things, uh, the way one thinks in uh, connections to direct applications, word problems, uh, and being able to apply the mathematical concepts to a, as close to real life as possible, considering the the level of mathematics they're at. Uh, you know, communication of uh, reasoning is a fundamental part of mastering a lot of mathematical objectives, if not all, uh, and to show the understanding of the mathematical concept, the applications of the concept, uh, and how they're both connected to, you know, a, a specific scenario. And, and obviously, you know, they both innately involve uh, reading. Um, and proficiency in literacy, and we'll, I'll discuss specific research later, but it, it makes it easier for one to build uh, new connections or connections with new mathematical terminology and concepts uh, and mathematical literacy. Um, and if, if someone has difficulty with reading and writing, you throw in a bunch of foreign terms, mathematical language, uh, and it can become a, a, a jumbled mess. Um, so they're different, but they're similar and, and, and both, and both related, you know, general literacy is going to correlate to mathematical literacy and, and vice versa. Erica, what about reading in science? Is it the same? Yeah. I'd love to talk about how it's different if you go to slide five. 
yeah, here we go. All right, everybody, I could use your advice. Let's pretend that I'm your science teacher and I've given you this to read and you're great students and you read it and you're working hard to get the right answers. And now I'm gonna test you. Everybody, what is Traxeline? Speak up. I know you're a great class. And don't worry, I won't take points off if you're wrong. What is Traxeline? Oh, pick me, pick me. Oh, yes, Erica, what is it? Traxeline is a new form of Xyanter. Good job, student, yes. Okay, let's see if anyone else can help with my next question. Where is Traxeline Montilde? Yes, yes. What's the answer? Yes, you are such a good student. Oh my goodness, thank you very much. We are learning so much about Traxeline. How is Traxeline placelled? Well, the Christinians crystallate large amounts of Fevon and then bracter it to quasal Traxeline. Hey, we got it right there. Okay, so going back to our teacher hats for a minute, um, I think we probably all maybe have had an experience like this in science class before where you are helping out the teacher, you are answering the questions correctly, but then you walk out of there and you're like, oh, I don't know if I understood anything. So there's a lot to talk about today, but I just wanted to kind of bring us back into the mode and remember what it's like to be a student in some of our science classes where um, we do read differently in science because sometimes it feels like a different language. So then how is it the same? Well, I, I think I'm kind of on the, on the spot of where it's different. Okay. Um, because science is an empirical study of the natural world. And so if we're really doing science, we are getting in there with our hands. We're using our senses to explore the natural world. And we're doing critical thinking, discussing data, and doing scientific inquiry. And we're making sure we're talking about natural things. So sometimes when we think we're doing science, by asking our students to maybe read a book like this, like the Garden Book, or Isaac Newton's biography, or a collection of rocks, or reading a bunch of cool science trivia. We can learn a lot of the facts about science, but once again, we could just be um, saying some words, maybe we don't understand the processes behind them. So when we're talking about science, it's really important to help make sure that uh, we don't read it just like a textbook. Okay. Becca, I'm going to come back to you. I think you're unfrozen now. So. Sounds great. My, you know, I'm on campus and I guess my internet connection is still unstable, but hopefully it will uh, uh, okay. be okay for the rest of the time. So thinking about how uh, reading in math is the same as other disciplines, you know, really just going back to what Brendan was saying too, um, it really makes me think of critical thinking and how that is important across all disciplines because reading in math like others involves analyzing and interpreting information, right? And so, and so like, for example, uh, we need to be able to evaluate the steps in a proof, um, which is similar to analyzing like the argument structure in a persuasive essay. So I could see it being similar in that way. As far as it being different, I really think in terms of precision, because we're thinking in terms of like symbols, instructions, whereas other disciplines can be more interpretive, right? But mathematics is just more precise because for example, uh, if we're thinking about the uh, uh, comparison of X being greater than five, well, that strictly means that you know, X is greater than five, which would be different than say a metaphor in literature, which could have multiple meanings. Okay. Um, and then also the abstractness associated with mathematics. Um, you know, we can get into abstract reasoning, which can be really different from, you know, other like subjects, which might be more grounded. Uh, for example, like whenever we're thinking about infinity and imaginary numbers and mathematics, like that's so much more abstract than something that's not taught, you know, than something that's tied to um, like a scientific experiment, right? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I was thinking about, um, um, Tolga was asking the question, the best way to tell kids that it is different and how to help them understand that difference. In a lot of ways, um, 
it, and so Erica was putting hers in there too, but I think about reading science and math is you have to be almost intentional about what you do as you do in reading, um, learning to read in your literature classes. So you have to do the building blocks. You have to help them understand how to read for purpose, read for the information that's important and, and to decipher and put it into thinking about a word problem, how to put it into the correct format, how to put it and make it make sense. You have to show them that much like you have to show them how to read a sentence or how to start that process. I love what you said, Angie, because like I can read about the rock cycle, but it's just memorizing facts. I'm not actually understanding it the same way I am when I'm doing a lab with the rocks. So sometimes we think that just read a textbook, we're doing the science and it is important to read the textbook and process it, but it's really hard to process the science information without a like hands-on phenomenon experience in the natural world to go with it and help support their learning. These are all, keep putting the questions in chat, keep talking through the chat. We're happy to, we've got a few questions, but we're happy to add others in as we go. Um, okay. What are common misconceptions about reading in your STEM field? Brennan. So uh, I, I kind of took this initially from a, a student's point of view, uh, their misconceptions. Um, one of the most common phrases I hear from students or a variation thereof is, I don't understand any of this. Uh, but typically when you break it down with the student, it, it more comes down to not understanding one, maybe two at most specific parts. And most often it's related to not understanding um, how the concept is applied, or in other words, not fully understanding the mathematical language. The the, the example of uh, the, the terms that Erica just gave is a perfect example uh, of how it can just become a jumbled mess when you're defining words with other words and you don't understand the meaning of any of them. Uh, you really lose uh, the purpose. Um, another one is I will never use this. You know, often students do go into a STEM related field and they they, they will use it directly. Uh, but to me, that's not the main point uh, of mathematics um, or at least not one of the main points, plural, uh, which is, you know, developing reasoning and logic skills and by learning the concepts and processes uh, and, and the applications it changes the way one thinks. Uh, and then those skills can be applied to a, you know, anything we encounter on a daily basis. Um, another one, especially in the online setting where uh, uh, the only way we can really truly assess knowledge is through uh, you know, a formal exam. Uh, we don't get to meet with a student on a daily basis and see the ins and outs. And uh, it requires them to come, come to us a lot of the times. But for you know, formative assessments, understanding is enough. But then when you get to that, uh, you know, true uh, assessment of an exam, summative assessment, we have to know the material uh, in order to demonstrate mastery of uh, the objectives, the mathematical concepts, so on and so forth. Um, and then last but not least, you know, the student might say that they don't need to read to, to succeed in math. And that might be true, but it's an exception to the rule. And, and you know, reading skills are fundamental fundamental to to mastering the mathematical objectives, uh, not only because of the the, the intense mathematical vocabulary, uh, but but because you know scenarios re the real life scenarios the application problems are described in in prose word problems, uh, and they have to be analyzed similarly to you know reading and, and comprehension just with a lot of uh, math jargon. And then you have courses uh, that, that are innately uh, very heavily reading and vocabulary based, even more so than other math courses, uh, such as statistics. Um, and they're also, you know, they can be writing intensive. And again, having a, having that leg up by, you know, being competent in, in reading comprehension, uh, you're already a step ahead of someone who, who, who isn't. Okay. Becca? Yeah, those are really great points, Brennan. And it really makes me think about, you know, my experience teaching uh, mathematics, how so many students think mathematics is just about numbers. It's not about reading. 
Um, and, you know, they, they think that they can, you know, solve problems that just be, by only, you know, manipulating numbers and formulas, but it is so much more than that, right? We must understand um, what those numbers and formulas mean in the context of the problem. Um, and so I feel like that's definitely a big misconception yeah. about reading and math. And then also, so, and then also that, you know, the text and math problems, it's not just filler. And so I, I, you know, kind of building on that idea a little bit. So we want to be careful to make sure we're not overlooking like the scenarios being presented in the word problems, um, thinking it's irrelevant. I'm just going to look at the numbers and I'm going to solve this. We want to, you know, sometimes, most often, um, the context, right, of the problem is going to provide us with the the ideas that we need to know in order to approach the problem or what's being asked. So um, I think those are, that's definitely one big misconception I've run into in the past. Yeah. Erica? Yeah. Um, is it okay if we just jump to the next slide? Sure. Yeah. So um, talking about um, common misconceptions about reading and science, I'm not saying get rid of the science textbooks. I think they're really important. But when we are using the science textbooks, they're not the science class. So this is a page. Um, can you tell, can, is the screen big enough? Can you tell what kind of text this is? Yeah, I wasn't sure if the picture would come out all right. So this is a chemistry textbook. Mm -hmm. And I think you've all remember, you probably had a chance where it's very much like a math textbook sometimes. So I thought this might be a good example to talk about some of the misconceptions um, one of the biggest misconceptions I get from students is they think, well, the only part I need to read is those two paragraphs down at the bottom in the main course of the book. And they take notes on that part, and that's the only part they study. But that's only a fourth of the page. Um, I don't want to speak for the math team, but I think one thing that we have in common with the math team is that a science textbook can have lots of sample problems. And those problems are highlighted and they have big titles like this one is sample problem 1.11.5 and it has blue color around the box and it's not that big and bold because it's cute and pretty and they just ran out of ideas that's the main idea but so many of my students will just skip it they won't even read it um, and i think that happens in math too it's like we're not just filling up space it's not optional this is where to focus and not just can i find the answer but can i do the steps so I encourage students when they're working a class with a textbook with sample problems in science, do the problem more than once. Do it once where they see the answers, cover the answers, do it again. And most importantly, I mean, we've probably all been there. Why? Why are we doing this problem in science? How did the math that we learned in another class be useful for what I'm trying to figure out about a natural process in the world? One time I had a student go, oh, what? This is algebra? Like she didn't even make that connection between basic what she had in her math class to chemistry. So that helped me as a teacher. Now I know, tell my students, we're doing regular math. You know how to do this. It's not mysterious. But off on my sidetrack, another, of course, important strategy and a misconception, they won't read the pictures or the tables. Well, why is the table on the bottom half of this page there? because it's important for understanding the trend that connects back to the relationship of the atoms that they learned in previous chapters. So when it comes to reading and science, um, I would consider a textbook more like a workbook where you go back and forth and you highlight and you answer questions versus a novel where you read it and infer what the characters are doing. There's just uh, not that place for successful reading in science. It's definitely, a text you want to interact with. Okay, thank you. Next question, why is knowing how to read in your STEM field important? I guess we're just gonna stay going in a, the same order. There you go, Brennan, you're up. Okay, I'd like to actually cover the the, the last two first because it's basically what we've already discussed. Uh, you know, beyond it, the general notion of it's a language within a language, uh, Reading comprehension and proficiency in literacy is key to understanding, interpreting, analyzing uh, problems. But to me, the, the as a math person, the, the the proof is in the numbers. Um, 
there's a, a general consens consensus that there's you know a strong correlation between uh, literacy and mathematics proficiency. Um, and, and I can provide a, a whole list of of resources. Uh, ju just uh, message me after message or email me after and we, we get done here. Um, but and they they all focus on primary grades. It, it becomes more difficult the the older one a uh, student gets because the, there's more extraneous variables, confounding factors that are introduced into the situation, which makes it more difficult to control for. Uh, but beyond just there being a correlative nature, uh, you know, there are more and more researchers who are uh, purporting that there is a directional relationship. And, and there's three main uh, interpretations of, of, of what that direction is. Um, you know, you have some that early reading skills are uh, predictive of uh, math development. Uh, you have others that uh, there's an actual causal relationship. Language has a causal influence on uh, some aspects of, of numeracy when, when students first learn about numbers and math. But uh, what's gaining the most traction is, is that they're both directly linked to one another um in that phonological processing and uh vocabulary li linguistic skills uh are important to form visual and verbal representations uh of numbers um and this has led to a whole slew of uh, of studies in more recent years uh that suggest there's a co-directional relationship uh that because they're similar uh one influences the other and so as you're doing one, you're helping in, in, in learning the other. Yeah, th those are I really like the phrase language within a language, you know, because reading is it helps to build conceptual understanding. It's so much more than just procedures that we memorize to solve a problem. Um, and so that's that's why reading is so important. Um, but, you know. We must, you know, also understand that mathematics is very logical, the sequence that we solve problems in and, you know, each step in a procedure, we need to be able to carefully follow that type of logical sequence. And so that requires us to be able to carefully read um, and, and to interpret the problem. And so it helps us like apply our skills to in practical situations, right? And so especially like today, the, the importance of being able to interpret data, right, read graphs and understand statistical information is so important. And, and that absolutely requires literacy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Erica. I love this question. And I think I'm going to start with uh, imagine. let's imagine that you just heard that if you put an acorn in your shoe, and walk around with it, it will cure your back problems and the pressure will make your heart beat better. Okay, so what am I trying to get at? There's so many things that we hear on a daily basis about the natural world. And if we are not scientifically literate, if we are not reading well in our science courses, then we become uh, fodder for falling into bad tricks where that could cost us our money or cost us our health. And so reading in science is so important because if, if I know just a little bit about the circulatory system and muscles, I can start being a critical thinker and saying, I don't understand how an acorn in my shoe would help me with those things. So um, when we're good readers in science, we can help understand what scientists actually do, understand those science concepts, as the math team said so eloquently, interpret data, evaluate our arguments, write science reports, understand scientific research. And by being a strong reader in science and learning those tricks about solving problems and figuring out tricky vocabulary words, it helps us become stronger readers in other disciplines as well. Um, and it all comes back down to that acorn in the shoe. We can apply it in so many ways, much bigger and more dangerous and world encompassing than a acorn in the shoe, but um, by being able to think through the inquiry process and say, you're making a claim, what is the evidence? Give me evidence before I can justify this and draw a conclusion from it. That can help us be, and our students to be much less likely to fall into tricks and, by, and places like scams. Okay, thank you. 
how can we help students better understand how to read in your STEM discipline? How can we help students be successful? So at least at, at my level, uh, you know, the, the high school level, um, that's what these focus on for, for me at the elementary level, it's going to, there are going to be a lot different nuances, but for me, I, I promote cross-curricular activities. I love it when I'm able to include a science project in, in the math course, include a history project in the, the math course. I, I might get a few grunts and, and moans, but uh, you know, in, in general, it, it's worth it. Even if it's writing about, you know, a, a mathematical historical figure, it connects the two and, and makes the math more meaningful as well. Um, I think it's important to assess reading skills first. Uh, especially being an international school, you know, English as a second language can be an issue at times in, in math courses, uh, especially if the, there's no native language version of uh, the textbook. It's not like they can copy and paste from a hard copy if we use one. Um, drive home vocabulary. It might even seem backwards, but I'm a big proponent of introduce the vocabulary as soon as possible, even if they don't understand how it's applied. If they have that, uh, you know, definition memorized, it's easier to apply it when they get to it. Uh, math kind of, you know, unlike a lot of other subjects, you kind of learn it like a piecewise function. I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get it. And then after you make it habit, you, you, you jump up. Yeah. And I really just want to also, you know, say that again is like really focus on teaching the mathematical vocabulary because, it, we if we don't spend enough time defining and discussing terms like quotient, uh, radius, hypotenuse, how are they going to understand those terms in the context of the problem? We want to we want to drive home those concepts before we dive into problems that use those terms. Um, and I always, you know, I'm I'm I think incorporating lots of real world problems. Right, is super important because then, you know, it requires the students to read carefully and interpret to solve the mathematical problems so that students can see the importance of knowing how to read in math. I think that really drives that point home. And, you know, I'm a strong proponent of, of integrating, right? Co explicitly connect math to literacy. I mean, for example, you could have students summarize the steps of solving a problem, even in their own words, or teach students like how to identify main ideas, uh, and the problem and, and, and make inferences, um, you know, and I, so I think that's really, that can be really helpful by making those connections explicit in your teaching. And then I think probably the biggest thing is also just assessing and addressing misconceptions. I do this in the very beginning, right? You might even have an activity with the students um, at the very beginning of class asking questions like, what do you think mathematics is? Um, or do we need to be able to read in order to do math? And that way you can address some of those misconceptions right off the bat before you start diving into to teaching. Okay, I'm going to give Erica the last little bit and then we'll wrap up because we're just about at the end. So go, Erica. All right. If you can take a screenshot and you are a science teacher or you might have to ask your students to do some reading in science and you want to help them better understand their science, these tips are very useful. I've used them for almost 30 years. Um, make sure the questions that you ask activate what they already know. This will help focus their attention. Invite them all the time. Make questions. What do you think will happen before we read the material, while we're reading the material, after we read the material? Um, have a science passage or a sample problem that's tricky that you, re you visit more than once. And make sure when you give an idea, you're explaining the rock cycle, you give examples that are relevant to their lives. Talk about the rocks in their backyard, perhaps. Um, and then don't forget that it's not just the written word in science, which is so visual and so touch, 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 see, smell. Don't ignore the diagrams, illustrations, and images. And make sure they're not just cute, if possible, can those images help teach the ideas as well? It kind of goes back to our main speaker this morning about our slow looking. If our students are good at that, that will help them be better at picking up science information from their data. And the next slide is a fair model for all that crazy vocabulary. And anyone who is a little nervous about all the vocabulary or you'd like another idea for how you might be able to dig deeper into some of the hard words, um, this fair model is a classic um, visual 
graphic organizer. Uh, you, I hope you've seen this before, but if not, uh, the word you're interested in goes in the middle. And then you ask your students to process that vocabulary word in four different ways. It's your choice. In this case, they ask them to write the textbook definition, write down the characteristics of that vocabulary word, give some examples, and then also give some non-examples. I know time is short. I love talking about this, but I'm going to stop right there, Angie. Okay. Thank you. I want to just say thank you to um, Erica, Brennan, and Becca for coming today and, and indulging me in this conversation. Um, I, I, there's so much that's important about reading in STEM and how it connects across. It's not it's not by itself. It's not out in its own island. Stephanie said it in in a comment in the in the chat that it's connected to what we do. And when we can make those connections, students can learn more. I just I feel that across the board. If we can teach them about reading in a way that makes sense for them and make those connections, then we've opened the world for them. So thank you all very much for being part of the session. And I know we've got to transition to the next one. So I'm gonna let us move on to the next session.